Okay, so we have uh, Andre Pop here today. Uh, we're going to talk about carotid screening um, before TAVR. This is something that, that I've been interested in. We just are looking to make some changes in my program. So um, interested to hear what, what he does in his program. Andre, why don't you take it away? Hey, guys. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, so we'll talk about uh, carotid ultrasound and uh, where it fits in the uh, workup of patients going for TAVR. As you know, uh, TAVR has become a lot more minimalistic, um, and um, a lot of the testing that we did back in the days may no longer be appropriate. So um, we started screening everybody uh, with carotids uh, back in the early days based on the experience in surgery. Um, there is currently no direct evidence that supports the routine use of carotid ultrasound before TAVR. Uh, there is actually evidence to the contrary. Uh, these are a couple of uh, papers that show you that uh, basically uh, the degree of stenosis on carotid duplex is not a good indicator of which of your patients uh, should uh, will get a, a stroke uh, during or after TAVR. Um, there is uh, no uh, statistically significant association between the degree of carotid artery stenosis and the rate of stroke. Um, there was a recent uh, meta-analysis, as you can see, published in American Journal of Cardiology in 2023 and showed that there is no benefit of carotid artery screening before TAVI. Um, so in my mind, uh, doing routine screening uh, only leads to increased costs. It delays the treatment of aortic stenosis and it may expose patients to unnecessary testing and treatment. Um, obviously, if you find a patient that has uh, severe carotid artery stenosis and you want to treat them, you now have a patient who has uh, severe aortic stenosis and is going for vascular surgery, which puts them at very high risk. Um, there are certainly selected uh, situations where carotid imaging can be justified. If you're going to do carotid access, you do want to know what your anatomy is and make sure that uh, you go on the side with a higher degree of stenosis. And there's actually recommendations from uh, ABIM, Society of Thoracic Surgery, Society of Vascular Surgery, which recommend against routine carotid ultrasound prior to cardiac surgery. Wow. So that's it. Cardiac surgery. Wow. I did not know that. Boom. Yeah. yeah, I think I always thought this was kind of controversial because, you know, our surgeons always push back when we tell them we don't want to, we try to eliminate tests and our surgeons always say, well, this is, we, we do this, so why, why don't you do that? And I think, you know, clearly the lines have split between TAVR and surgery now where TAVR is becoming much more minimalistic in PCI. So to, to argue against, so I let's say I put a Sentinel in on every case, Andre, what would you say to concerns I have that I don't really want to stick the Sentinel device up in the left carotid without knowing if the patient has some nasty occlusion or some sort of horrible plaque there? So I, I think the way we do our CAT scans, uh, we generally scan a few centimeters up at the base of the neck. So in most cases, you get at least close to the carotid bifurcation if you don't get the carotid bifurcation. Um, that should give you enough information about the area where you're going to place the sentinel. Really, for Sentinel, you care about the proximal most carotid. Um, your wire may go a few centimeters higher, but really, ideally, your wire probably does not need to go into the brain. And you certainly want to keep your wire on the screen. So yeah. if you're, if you're going to do some imaging of the carotid in the cath lab when you, um, when you start, uh, that basically obviates the need for this. Also, uh, even if you're not going to do that, if you keep your wire where you can see it, uh, uh, you should not need to have imaging of the internal carotid artery bifurcation. Got it. Got it. So, Andre, you stopped doing carotids routinely screening in your TAVR, in your TAVR program? Yeah, we haven't done it. I, I, God, I can't even remember when it was. Last time we did it, probably more than five years ago. Wow. Yeah, and we're just making that change now. Have you had any bad, like... Have you had any kind of bad experiences? Um, have you ever had a case where it changes management? You know, honestly, I mean, the rate of stroke these days, knock on wood, is so low uh, that it's it doesn't really make sense. Um, it's 
anytime we see a stroke, uh, you know, uh, the neurologists come and they do their whole workup and uh, they take, you know, the 98 year old and they do a bubble study and whatever. And (laughs) (laughs) we all know that if you have a stroke during a TAVR, it's going to be either from the arch or from the valve. It's not going to be from your carotid. You have nothing to do with the carotid. um, And it, it just does not make sense. I mean, even if you find a carotid stenosis, a severe asymptomatic by definition carotid artery stenosis, the data for treating that is very weak. So there's, you know, we may finally have a study that tells us that we shouldn't treat, but right now the data is extremely weak. And um, even the original data from the uh, uh, ACAS and uh, the old time studies uh, showed in subgroup analysis, the elderly benefited very little, uh, and mm-hmm. especially elderly women did not benefit at all. So I think it doesn't make any sense to to screen. If you find the disease, what are you going to do with it? Are you going to send an asymptomatic person for a surgery for it, which there is no benefit? And then finally, are you going to send them while they have severe symptomatic aortic stenosis? I mean, that's a super high-risk surgery. Right. And what about and, keeping the blood pressure higher? I mean, does that make any difference? I mean, okay, so I did the screening, high grade. I've got a patient coming up. He's got occluded MCA that we found through, you know, crowded screening and then an MRA, which we're doing, not really doing anymore. But, I mean, I guess I'm going to keep his blood pressure a little higher than the tavern, but. I, I guess if you know that going in, you you might want to do that. But I think the. First of all, the evidence for that is not strong. Sure. And I mean, the the procedures, the the time when you have a low blood pressure is so limited that it it truly doesn't uh doesn't make a difference. Now, different story if you're doing carotid access. Obviously, in carotid access cases, you have to keep the blood pressure high. But there the the period of uh, uh brain hypoperfusion is a lot longer. But in a standard transfemoral case, you're dropping their pressure for what, 10 seconds. So yeah. it, it doesn't really make a difference. Yeah, yeah two, good, yeah, two good points there, Andre, which is that when you're doing carotid, you're going to stick the side with more disease. Mm-hmm. Um, and I also liked on your CAT scan, which we've kind of made, once we got rid of the carotids, we're scanning up a little higher into the neck on the, on the pre-op CT, which I think is kind of gives you all you need and it's not a big difference in contrast or anything. So, yeah. Yeah. I think the, the only pushback that you may get uh, as you're trying to add more um, information into your CAT scan is that the people who read them may start pushing back because if you're doing a TAVR CTA and you're asking them to read the coronaries and to read the carotids, then it, it's a lot. You know, yeah. um, and and honestly, if I'm going to do, let's say I have a patient that's going for a carotid TAVR, I may just do a dedicated carotid CTA, which includes the brain and gives me a good idea about the circle of Willis. Uh, and that's going to be read by somebody who, who looks at that all the time. But for the standard transfemoral case, there's there's really no need. Totally agree. I will say, though, I don't know if you guys have had this type of patient. There's, like, this phenotype of patient with their vascular paths, and they have, like, a shit ton of intracranial stenoses. And the second their blood pressure gets below 120, they have stroke-like symptoms. Have you guys ever had patients like that? Like, they're scary as hell, but I've had a couple, and they're just so sensitive to changes in blood pressure because they have all these fixed intracranial stenoses, and they can't autoregulate. Like, have you guys ever had that? Yeah, my my first... uh... First carotid case in uh, in clinical practice was a total disaster. Was uh, I was using I don't know if you guys remember the MoMA. It was a, MoMA, a du- yeah du- dual balloon uh, carotid uh, reverse flow kind of thing. And the moment I put it up, the the patient uh, basically developed uh, stroke symptoms, took it right. down. Stroke symptoms went away, and I uh, I kind of bailed out. Uh, yeah. But yes, sure. I mean, there's going to be, you know, there's going to be red herrings everywhere. There's going to be patients who are going to be super sensitive. There's going to be patients who are super calcified, super nasty. But I think if we're we're looking at a system approach and if you're looking at something that's supported by the evidence, 
at this point, there is no evidence to support uh, routine screening of the carotids. All right. So, yeah, to wrap things up here. So, you have a patient. You do your routine TAB or CAT scan. We're going to skip the carotid ultrasound. If they need alt access, then you may do a ultrasound or CT of the neck. Yeah. Or both. Which, which, which do you like? So... I I love CT for all uh, intents and purposes. Uh, I think it gives me a tremendous amount of information. Uh, I, you know, because I trained back in the days in carotid stenting, I love looking at the circular willis and figuring out if the hemisphere is isolated or all that kind of stuff. But honestly, I don't think there's even evidence for that. And I think that when I talk to the surgeons, all they ask for is get me a carotid duplex and then talk to the anesthesiologist to keep the blood pressure up. And and I think for, for carotid access in particular, that's a very important point because, you know, during carotid access, that artery is going to be occluded or semi-occluded for a lot longer. It's the whole duration of the sheath being in. So there it, it makes a big difference. But the the proper approach to that, I think, is keep the blood pressure up. Don't, uh, you know, don't do extensive imaging. Awesome. All right. Thank you, man. That was great. That was great. Thank you, guys. Thanks.